Thank you so much uh, for such a lovely introduction and thank you for having me back again here at the Society of Antiquaries. Can everyone hear me okay? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes? Excellent. Okay, so um, just by way of introduction, um, just building on what uh, Liz was saying about my background, I just wanted to start by telling you a little bit about cathedral archaeology and a little bit about me. So I am the third cathedral archaeologist at Canterbury. So my predecessors are Tim Tatton Brown and Martin Biddle, who both still uh, retain posts um, working in consultant archaeology. So Martin is at Winchester and St Albans cathedrals, and Tim Tatton Brown is the consultant archaeologist for the Houses of Parliament, amongst other places. So I am very much following in uh, their footsteps and in, in fact today's lecture is very much uh, building on and drawing on the expertise of many, many other people who have worked at Canterbury. So I hope I'm able to share some of those stories with you today uh, effectively. <laughs> so as Liz mentioned, um, I worked at Southwark Cathedral in London for eight years as their cathedral archaeologist. And I also worked for the Thames Discovery Programme, again here in London, which is a community archaeology project uh, working with volunteers on the tidal foreshore. So here we see a picture of uh, the FROG, that's the Foreshore Recording and Observation Group, uh, working on the foreshore in front of Greenwich Palace and surveying the remains of a, a 16th and 17th century timber jetty. Now, um, there's lots and lots of links uh, to be drawn, of course, between London and Canterbury, and Greenwich is, 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 a, is a good place to start. It's obviously the site of the martyrdom of St Alphage by uh, the Danes in the early 11th century. So, again, just drawing on Liz's introduction, my current role with the National Trust is as a regional archaeologist, and for... The last eight years or so, um, we have been very much focused within the National Trust on the project at Knoll in Sevenoaks, which is, uh, in another lovely link to Canterbury, uh, an Archbishop's Palace. So it was acquired by Archbishop Thomas Bourchet in the mid-15th century. So we've been learning a huge amount more about that building over the last eight years or so. So what does a cathedral archaeologist do? So my responsibility is as a, um, an expert advisor to the dean and chapter. So that means I have a, a sort of engagement with all aspects of archaeological work at the cathedral and um, anything that has an impact to uh, the building or the buried archaeology. Also a role within looking at uh, artefacts and collections, so an, um, a sort of uh, an overview of the inventory and uh, undertaking research and engagement, which of which today's lecture is very much uh, a part. So in today's lecture, um, I'm going to try and cover sort of touching on the following themes. So looking at some of the histories of investigation, uh, notable discoveries. Now at a site like Canterbury, that's been quite hard to narrow down. Um, so we're going to weave in and out of that. I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, Canterbury Journey, which is a very large project currently underway at the Cathedral, and touch on some other projects also uh, underway. And I'm going to finish uh, by looking at Thomas Beckett and some of the commemorations um, and research that is un underway, uh, given the significant anniversary we have uh, at the Cathedral this year. So uh, a quick show of hands. Has everyone been to Canterbury Cathedral? Okay, well you know everything then, I'll just get my coat and, uh, and I'll hide <laughs> away. Uh, so as you, will, as you will know, it's an incredibly complex building. Um, the, the, the phase plans are, are both, <laughs> both beautiful um, and complicated. Uh, they are a joy to work with. So understanding uh, this very um, long chronology of the building has formed a big part of my work since I started um, as the Cathedral Archaeologist at Canterbury, which was about three and a half years ago. So there is a huge amount to, to understand, there is a huge amount to unpick. Within the built fabric, there is everything uh, standing from the late 11th century all the way through to the modern period, to the 20th and 21st centuries. So there's a, there is a, a, a complex 
sequence uh, of a, an enormous 3D jigsaw puzzle uh, to tussle with. Now, of course, as well, um, underneath all of that, we have the remains of uh, even earlier activity at the site of Canterbury. Uh, this is my only slide covering the Roman period. Um, I am not a specialist in uh, the Roman period. Evidence has been revealed by uh, Canterbury Archaeological Trust through excavations at the site in a number of locations for Roman activity at the site. So we are within the walled uh, circuit of the Roman uh, town of Canterbury. So there is evidence for routeways, there is evidence for structures. Um, in particular, these are rather beautiful third century uh, artifacts recovered from excavations in the area of St. Gabriel's Cathedral, so very close to uh, the, the current cathedral building. Um, and they, they possibly indicate a, a temple on the site there. So the sort of evidence for religious or ritual activity at Canterbury potentially stre stretches all the way back into the Roman period. And that's the Romans, ladies and gentlemen. Um, also underneath uh, the present cathedral building, uh, large scale excavations during the 1990s, again by Canterbury Archaeological Trust, revealed the substantial remains of the Anglo-Saxon uh, building. So here we are looking uh, a long way down um, at the excavations in the nave, and uh, you can see the curve there of the uh, part of the western apse of the building. Uh, this has been fully published in a monograph by Paul Bennett and Kevin Blockley from 1997, um, and is, is a fantastic detailed account of all of the different evidence they found for the Anglo-Saxon Cathedral, the Norman Cathedral and subsequent uh, alterations to those structures. Just to pick out one um, beautiful find uh, from those excavations, and there were, there were many, um, but this one is, is certainly one of my favourites. This is one of uh, only four Anglo-Saxon uh, tiles that have been recovered from the cathedral site. Um, and just starts to give us that little bit of an insight into how these buildings were decorated, what the interiors might have looked like. Uh, and this is now uh, within the cathedral collections. We had another glimpse uh, of part of the Anglo-Saxon building uh, earlier last year during excavations in the cloister. So um, while this may look somewhat unprepossessing, that is Anglo-Saxon fabric that we are looking at. So it is part of an Anglo-Saxon uh, turret or, or stair tower to the northwest corner of the, the Anglo-Saxon cathedral. Now, the proposal in this space is to install a, uh, an access lift between the cloister, which is uh, several steps down from modern ground level. So it will enable greater sort of visitor access to this part of the building. So we will have to potentially remove a very small part of some of this Anglo-Saxon foundation in order to be able to, to uh, allow the installation of the lift uh, mechanism. So just to put uh, that part of the archaeology in context, here is the Anglo-Saxon cathedral as exposed during the 1990s excavations. Um, and here you see the, the blue is the Norman uh, Northwest Tower. So our site is just up here within this box, um, and you see the shape of the, the tower that was exposed. Um, so we have part of that. It was more fully exposed within the nave excavations here on the southwest side, and is still preserved under the present day floor. So the cloister is a, well, I mean, every bit of Canterbury Cathedral is interesting, frankly, but the, the cloister, um, just to focus on that for a moment, was used during the uh, post-medieval period as a burying place, as a cemetery site. So you can see from this uh, 18th century um, engraving, 19th century engraving, we had uh, upright gravestones in situ, which was still there in uh, this very early photograph from 1904 held by the, the Kent Archaeological Society. And what you might also notice is that the, the level of the ground surface here has been raised through that process of burying uh, in this space. So in the 1930s, there was a, a program of ground reduction uh, in the Cloister Garth, uh, and that revealed uh, this. Now, this, as far as I'm aware, is a, a unique Anglo-Saxon uh, item. It is a, a, a portable sundial dating to 
around the 10th century. If you visited the British Library's Anglo-Saxon Kingdoms exhibition last year, you may have seen this on display. It was within uh, that exhibition. Um, this is a, a wonderful and, and very puzzling artefact. Um, its context is really interesting because it, it appears to have come out of those top layers of soil uh, within the cloister garth, so within the sort of post-medieval uh, disturbance, one might say, and yet it has survived with not only uh, the, the main body of it attached, but also with its uh, gnomon, I think this is called, which is what allows you to use it as a sundial. So this slots into these little holes at the top here. You've got the months of the year on either side, uh, and you have a, a dedication to both the maker and the possessor uh, around the edge of the, uh, the artefact itself. Um, a particularly interesting thing about this uh, artefact is that apparently, uh, um, and again I'm quoting the work of others here, this sundial is designed to be used at, a, at a, a latitude that is significantly north of Canterbury Cathedral, so somewhere around Hexham is the suggestion. So what is it doing in the Cloistergarth uh, cemetery soils? How did it manage to stay all together? Uh, and, and why is it in the south of England when it appears to have been something that would have functioned much more accurately at latitudes further north? So this artefact will be going on display um, as uh, part of the Canterbury Journey project uh, during uh, 2020, and it will be within the Water Tower. Um, it's a new uh, space that will be opening to the public, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Another space that will be opening uh, to the public for uh, use as an exhibition uh, space, or a refurbished exhibition space, is in the crypt. So here you see, uh, again, members from the Canterbury Archaeological Trust at work uh, preparing the area for the laying of a new uh, floor in this space. And as I mentioned right at the beginning, this is one of the areas where we have some of the earliest uh, fabric surviving in the building. So the rear wall here is part of Lanfranc's building, so that takes us back to the 11th century. And they are looking here at the later extension in the uh, sort of late 11th and early 12th century uh, by Anselm. So we can see the sleeper walls of the crypt uh, underway here. One of the artifacts that is going on display in this space is this, um, which is a beautiful, uh, unique 15th century pilgrim badge, which was found on the Thames foreshore by mudlarker Tony Thera. Um, it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity to be able to display uh, a pilgrim badge depicting the martyrdom of Becket just metres from the space where that event actually happened. And this photo was taken, I think, just a day or so after uh, Tony had found uh, the badge on site. So you can see that the preservation of that artefact is, is amazing. So turning to uh, that sort of post-Beckett period, uh, a lot of what we see in the, the eastern arm of the cathedral relates to a reconstruction of the building after a very, very uh, dramatic and possibly suspiciously well-timed fire uh, in 1174. So Beckett was martyred in 1170. Uh, pilgrimage grows uh, through this period, visiting uh, his tomb in the crypt. There is a very uh, severe fire in 1174 and then a, a huge program of rebuilding subsequent to that, which completes in the 13th century. So here we're looking at a view of the eastern arm taken from the pulpitum screen. So we're looking straight uh, down towards uh, the shrine, where the shrine of Becket uh, was and the Corona Chapel right at the end. So a huge amount of work has been undertaken by the Centre for Christianity and Culture at the University of York to help us try and picture uh, that space. So this is a reconstruction showing uh, what the shrine might have looked like in around 1408. And you can see the sort of decorative elements, um, including the, the bejeweled uh, shrine here, uh, the Cosmati pavement on the floor, uh, the marble steps that lead up to the shrine. Um, the, the floor of the Trinity Chapel has been studied in detail by Tim Tatton-Brown and there is a fantastic article looking at the historic floor 
uh, in, a, in a book about medieval tiles, medieval floor surfaces generally, and there is much more work still to be done to fully understand uh, some of the aspects of the construction of that floor. Other research that has recently taken place at the cathedral, which you may have seen in the news, has been the work by Leonie Selinger and Rachel Koopmans looking at the stained glass within that eastern arm, so looking at some of the miracle windows uh, which are emplaced in honour of uh, Thomas Beckett and the wonders that come uh, from his uh, martyrdom. So Leonie and uh, Rachel's work has been unpicking the, uh, the glass itself and understanding which uh, fragments of which uh, there are substantial survivals from that late 12th and early 13th century original construction and which parts are uh, the, the sort of later replacements during the Victorian period, but demonstrating that these are some of the earliest depictions of pilgrims um, coming to Canterbury. And of course there has been a huge amount of work to uh, understanding the, the fabric of that 1180s uh, to 1220s rebuild, um, in particular again by the Canterbury Archaeological Trust, and just to pick out one uh, example of a detailed piece of recording undertaken by Rupert Austin, who is their specialist building, uh, buildings archaeologist there. This is the uh, South Oculus window here. Uh, which is part of that 1180s rebuild, um, and it retains, uh, astonishingly, its original uh, ferramenta, which are the iron bars that hold the glazing in place. Uh, and this is Rupert's exploded view of how that ferramenta fits together and how it all works. So a really beautiful uh, piece of building recording and understanding that 12th century engineering which is which is amazing and it's still there and it still works <laughs> it's still a window so um nearly exactly 700 years after the suspicious fire of 1174 we do have another uh, record of a fire in the eastern arm um, and I've just quoted here from the London Illustrated News from September 14th, 1872. It says, The fire which destroyed the roof of the east end of Canterbury Cathedral on Tuesday week and which threatened the entire destruction of that venerable building was mentioned in our last publication. It was caused by the upsetting of a pot of burning charcoal used by the plumbers employed to solder the leaden, cov leaden covering of the roof. The molten lead poured through to the woodwork below and the roof in that part was soon on fire. So it, it has echoes of that 12th century event and also of course echoes of a much more recent event. We all have seen last year's terrible fires at Notre Dame. So uh, certainly something that everyone is in the forefront of everyone's mind when undertaking a major infrastructure project. Also, uh, within the archive, we have uh, examples of a very early um, sampling strategy. So, amongst other items kept from 1872, we have this, which is the fused lead from the original roof uh, from the fire of 1872. So, within that program of rebuilding, reconstruction, <coughs> sort of putting the roof back on, there were samples taken which are now lodged within the library and archives um, from the building, so pieces of masonry and uh, lead and glass. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that um, we are currently uh, in the middle of a very large uh, infrastructure project at Canterbury Cathedral. This is called the Canterbury Journey and is a 25 million pound project, so a very substantial piece of work. Uh, we have the, the timeline of the project there in the middle. We're about here, uh, so we're sort of just over, well, well over halfway uh, through uh, an enormous uh, project. Now the picture on this side of the, the screen here is to show you the safety deck that is above the nave presently to allow work to take place um, to those upper levels of the building but has also been used for art installations over the last couple of years. So this is a, a, a world, a, it was a commemorative uh, art installation relating to the events of World War I, um, and those were all glass amphora ha hanging from uh, the roof deck there. So the Canterbury journey comprises a number of different elements. It uh, includes the um, creation of new exhibition spaces and interpretation, which, which we've touched upon already. 
exterior works to the nave and the western towers of the cathedral, uh, wide-ranging landscaping and infrastructure works, a new welcome centre, a shop and a community space, and conservation work to the Christchurch gate. So uh, the cathedral presently looks like this, um, which is can be quite a surprise when you come uh, in the Christchurch gate. There is a lot of scaffolding uh, across the whole of the western uh, half of the building. It can be quite noisy um, and it, it, is, it is to all intents and purposes a working site as well as remaining open to uh, anyone who would like to come and visit. Now obviously um, reactions uh, tend to be <laughs> mixed. Um, so <laughs> So if you have waited your whole life to come to Canterbury Cathedral and you are not appreciative of the scaffolding, this, this might be your response. I should add that this is from this august publication, uh, so it is not a real uh, piece of visitor impact. But it is worth uh, reflecting, of course, that this is not the first time that this building has been uh, a construction site. You don't have buildings as big as this without requiring considerable amounts of repair and conservation works regularly in order to retain uh, the fabric and make sure that it, everything is safe. So it is worth contemplating that while we are on our own uh, Canterbury journey, Chaucer's pilgrims heading their way to Canterbury in the, the late 14th century similarly would have been faced with a, a, a building in various stages of construction. Uh, this is yet another reconstruction drawing uh, from the University of York, uh, again in the sort of early years of the 15th century, and shows scaffolding uh, to that central part of the building there, so where Bell Harry is, so the rebuilding of the Angel Tower and parts of the uh, northern range uh, here. And if you haven't come across these reconstruction drawings before, uh, they are all available online, and I do encourage you to look at them. The work that has gone into creating these is, is incredible. Um, and what we were looking at was a zoomed-in view. Uh, actually, that this particular image includes uh, the whole of the walled town of Canterbury. So looking at, at, that, at the, the city at, in its early 15th century uh, phase, so looking at the individual buildings, and you can zoom in and have a look at all these different spaces. We have St Augustine's here, and also St Martin's right at the top of the view, so we have the World Heritage Site uh, also depicted uh, on this image. So uh, the, the view we looked at before with the, the glass uh, amphora in the shape of a ship was uh, immediately below where we see uh, this image. So here we are up on the top of the, the safety deck and we are looking at the, the nave vaults. So an amazing opportunity to get up close and personal with that part of the uh, late 14th, early 15th century building. And obviously an opportunity to undertake uh, conservation work, repair work and a huge amount of recording. So just, to, we've sort of looked at the uh, 12th century end of the building, just to have a quick look at the, uh, the later parts. The uh, cloister as well was largely reconstructed in the late 14th uh, century. And um, this uh, roof boss is said to depict Henry Yeavely, who was uh, one of the master masons of the period um, and who worked at Canterbury. And here is a view of that cloister, just showing um, the sort of major rebuild um, of the space. So we're looking here down the, this is the southern walk, so that is the entrance to the martyrdom at the end there. Through the 15th century, we had further building works at the western end of the cathedral, including fan vaulting uh, installed in the Lady Chapel and in the southwest tower. The Pulpitum screen similarly dates from 1450s, 1460s, so the uh, sort of construction of the major division between uh, the monastic areas of the church and uh, the more public spaces in the nave. And finishing up here in the 1490s with uh, the fan vaulting installed at below uh, the Bell Harry. So this is all just to sort of reiterate the point that um, 
the Canterbury journey, while, while its impact visually is quite uh, large, it is certainly not something that is historically without uh, precedent at this site. One of the last major building uh, programs was the Christchurch Gate, so completed in a, probably around 1570, 1520. So the, one of the last major, well, if not the last major building program uh, right before uh, the dissolution. And here we're looking at a mid 18th century view by Grimm. Uh, so we are standing within the precincts looking back at the Christchurch Gate. And it just gives us that little glimpse of the, the precinct buildings as well plus some of the activities that were possibly taking place. So we have a, a mason's workshop, people chatting, and quite a lot of dog walking, it would appear. So the Christchurch Gate is the, the part of the Canterbury Journey project that has most recently started. So scaffolding has just gone up. Um, and the, the, the main works to this space are, again, external repairs, and in particular, conservation work to some of the painted uh, elements of the gate. Um, the interior is equally as interesting, so we've, we've done a brief sort of assessment of that space. We have quite a lot of uh, historic graffiti in there, including some dating to the period of the Civil War, when we know that people were sort of occupying that space, um, and some very, very interesting artefacts, which um, uh, I came across in the archive the other day, which I'm going to save to another lecture, because they're, they're something quite special. Um, so the works to the exterior of the building, as I mentioned, have been uh, substantial. So the uh, nave roof essentially has uh, come off and gone back on again. Um, there's, a, as you can see, a huge amount of working at height. Uh, so repairs to the stonework of the northwest and southwest towers, right from the pinnacles of the building all the way uh, down. Um, and here you see Leanne Harter from Purcell Architects, Alex Bovey from the Courtauld, and Heather Newton, who is our Director of Conservation, uh, during a site visit. Uh, and that's me. I wasn't quite brave enough to go all the way up <laughs> to the very top. I really should, given I got all the way up there. Um, we've also been uh, looking at the, the uh, access to those roof spaces and looking at infrastructure which is now defunct uh, on those roof spaces. So this is the bell frame uh, on the top of the St Dunstan's Tower, the Southwest Tower, which as you can see when the lead uh, was removed, it was beyond uh, salvage. So uh, it has been recorded, it has been uh, removed, and I believe parts of it were recycled into pens, I think was uh, the, uh, the approach taken there. Um, the bell is, is no longer housed there, so it, it is a, a feature of the building which uh, has been changed. So an, an, another part of the, the works at height has been looking at the rainwater goods um, and bearing in mind the uh, vagaries of, of our modern weather, there needs to be some consideration as to how, uh, how water is circuited um, around the building. Now, there appears to have been a significant phase of uh, work to the rainwater goods in the middle part of the 18th century. So we have a whole had a whole series of uh, lead hoppers dated 1760 at Triforium level, um, which had been installed by basically removing parts of earlier uh, masonry and sort of, um, well, sticking them in is the best way of putting it. Uh, so these have been uh, reconfigured. Um, and for uh, the first time um, in many, many, many years, the stonemasons at Canterbury have been working on new gargoyles, uh, of which are these. Um, so these are designed in part to echo the, um, the carving uh, of the bosses in the nave vaults. So we see a lot of uh, animals being used in some of the um, heraldry in that space. So these are in part a reflection uh, of those. Turning to the nave space, um, I hope you can, well, it's a bit hard to make this one out, but um, this is a, a, a brilliant piece of recording work by Rupert, Rupert Austin and his team. This was um, funded by the Friends of Canterbury Cathedral. And what we are looking at is a record of Mason's marks uh, in the nave vaults. So hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of marks recorded across the walls and the vaults themselves. Uh, which Rupert's expert analysis allows us to uh, draw some conclusions. So uh, the next slide quotes um, from his report, and I do apologise because I've missed a sentence off at the bottom, but uh, you will get the general idea. 
So uh, the sort of highlights of, of, of his uh, research um, indicate that at least 55 masons made a significant contribution to the construction of this area within a relatively short uh, time frame. Some of those marks were concentrated within the sort of central parts of the structure. Um, and it, it, he's suggesting that basically the build moved in from the uh, eastern and western extremities and met in the middle, which is a bold uh, architectural strategy there. Um, the severy, which he mentions there, is this area here, right at the western end. Uh, and it appears to have been the, the last space that was completed also appears to have been used as, a, as an area of where the masons were working things out. So we do have a couple of architectural uh, sketches on the wall um, here. Another really fantastic discovery from Rupert's work is the, um, the evidence for reuse of uh, stone. So a number of the stones were marked twice um, with two different masons marks. So we think they were recycling the uh, Norman fabric into that later 14th and 15th century fabric and they were marking them up. So one mark is the original 12th century Mason's mark and the other is the 14th century Mason's mark, clocking them in and out. So uh, turning to the landscaping works, um, essentially the area that is being landscaped is this. Uh, so this is the Christchurch gate, this is the western end of the cathedral, this is Cathedral House in here and we have the study centre and conference centre and lodge over here. So a substantial uh, area of landscaping and also impact into this uh, part of the southern uh, precincts as well. So just to compare in terms of area, uh, we just overlaid here the extent of the nave excavations in the 1990s. So you'll see we, this is a, a substantial uh, project at Canterbury. So what does that work uh, is entailed? It's, it's uh, to do uh, with improving the below ground infrastructure. So looking at drainage, looking at services. So one of the first pieces of work was a long, uh, narrow trench along that south, south part of the precincts, um, which encountered the remains of parts of the medieval uh, drainage system as well as uh, over a hundred uh, inhumations. So this is the part of the site that was used as the lay cemetery uh, throughout the medieval period. Now some of the uh, deeper excavations, some of the, the, the sort of borehole uh, shafts did encounter Anglo-Saxon burials um, and extended into Roman archaeology. Uh, Roman archaeology was also encountered as part of the works to the new uh, Welcome Centre. So here is a photo from just last week, I think. Um, this is the new community space. This is the entrance uh, and the shop and welcome just here. And here is the Christchurch gate. So um, a huge amount of planning and mitigation went into the construction here, um, trying to cause as little damage to the surviving layers of archaeology as possible. Um, in terms of how the foundations of the building were set and looking at limiting those deeper interventions. Um, the, the deepest interventions were within the area of uh, the lift shaft in this building and they again did encounter uh, Roman archaeology and Canterbury Archaeological Trust are still uh, working through all the reports um, for these various phases of intervention. Uh, like the scaffolding, really the most visible uh, intervention to the spaces is the landscaping uh, works. And here is a, a photo from probably a couple of years ago now showing one of the earlier phases of work. So again, infrastructure, drainage, services, and uh, laying of a new surface. So bringing some uniformity to uh, those western parts of the cathedral precincts, um, new planting as well in some places. Obviously, uh, all of that means an enormous opportunity for archaeological uh, investigation. Uh, and it really obviously is not every day that you get to dig uh, around the western end of Canterbury Cathedral. So here's a photo of the trust uh, at the west end. So just outside, these are the offices of uh, the Surveyor to the Fabric, Purcell Architects. And you can see much disturbed. Um, so we've had a lot of truncation on this site, but there is evidence for post-medieval buildings in this area, some medieval buildings as well. 
Of particular interest uh, is, this, is this wall. Um, this marks the boundary between the cathedral precincts and the archbishop's palace. So this is a, a very significant uh, landscape feature in the past, which does not exist in our, our modern uh, view. Um, and as the uh, excavations have moved, or the landscaping has moved further to the north, we are now uh, within the area of the Archbishop's uh, Palace, within, right within his precinct, and starting to uh, look at some of his um, buildings. So just a couple of artefacts to sort of highlight from here. This one is a, is a bread token. So this is a bread token dating from around uh, 1656, and I'm indebted to Francis Morgan from Canterbury Archaeological Trust for this information. So bread tokens were, uh, were tokens of this kind were often minted uh, in, in lieu of coinage during the 17th century. Um, uh, another uh, lovely find uh, is this Nuremberg jeton. So it's a uh, Hans Krauwinkel um, II, so dating from around 1580s to the 1630s, and uh, most appropriately for uh, an artifact like this found uh, where it was, uh, the legend on it, it says, God's kingdom endures forever. So uh, it's a very <laughs> wonderful thing to have found in this space. So we're starting to build a picture of that sort of post-medieval activity at the western end of the cathedral, both in the, in the sort of public spaces, so places that would have been used as shops or informal marketplaces, places that people are visiting, they're dropping items, um, places that people are living as well. So in the, uh, in the, the excavations in the Welcome Centre, we have evidence for you know, the backs of houses and drainage and cesspits, um, and some evidence as well, as I mentioned, for the, the actual construction of the Archbishop's Palace here. So this wall, um, which is right outside the present Old Palace gates, is part, we think, or uh, Canterbury Archaeological Trust thinks, um, Phil Main, their site supervisor, and Alison Hicks have been uh, sort of assessing the archaeology from this site and have identified this fragment as part of the Elizabethan um, Archbishop's Palace, so reconstructed by Archbishop Parker, um, and he was able to host Queen Elizabeth for a grand dinner for her 40th birthday uh, in the Archbishop's Palace at Canterbury in the 1570s. Uh, William Urry, who was the archivist at Canterbury Cathedral during the 1960s, also uh, found uh, these. There are two of these drawings in the Bodleian Library. These are from 1683 and show the western end of the cathedral, the Archbishop's Palace, so we possibly have part of this wall here, uh, various boundary walls running through here, and buildings on the site in the 17th century. And Tim Tatton Brown has done a, a huge amount of work on the earlier uh, medieval palace as well. We should note through excavations in the 1970s, so looking at the phasing um, and the very, very grand buildings that formed part of um, the palace during the medieval period. Uh, of course, the uh, palace is just one of a, a, a network of um, buildings um, and palaces that were used by the archbishops during the medieval period. Uh, we've already mentioned uh, Knoll. Realise I'm going to have to go faster. So, coming back to the cloister excavations, um, so we looked at the Anglo Saxon Tower uh, before. Above it um, were the remains of a medieval tiled surface, um, which was lifted uh, early last year by Dana Goodbrand Brown and Marie here. This is Emma Norton from the Cathedral's Conservation Department and uh, Jess from the Canterbury Archaeological Trust. Now within a very, very small amount of certificate, sort of 300, 400 mil, we have everything from Victorian archaeology right the way down to Anglo-Saxon. Uh, they very kindly let me join in as well. So um, we lifted all of the uh, tiles uh, by hand. They were packaged with a, a protective layer of clay. Um, and they are now being uh, conserved by Emma in uh, the Cathedral Conservation Studio. So this tile floor is, is extremely interesting. Um, it is uh, comprised of uh, fleur-de-lis pattern tiles and plain black tiles. We also have this, uh, which we'll turn to in a moment, which may be a later insertion. Um, those particular kinds of tiles um, and the other one we're going to look at in more detail are dated to the late 13th to early 14th century. 
so they actually, well, they, they represent one of, one of two things. They are either a reflooring of the Norman cloister, or they are a recycling of older tiles in the 14th century cloister. So one or the other, but they are an in situ uh, tile floor, which we've had a little uh, glimpse into. Um, this is a close up uh, of that one I just mentioned earlier. This is a, a probable pilgrim tile, again, similar sort of date. Again, Tyler Hill uh, Manufacture, which is just uh, north of Canterbury. Um, and there are comparative examples found uh, from other places in the country. This one is recorded from uh, Bedfordshire on the Portable Antiquities Scheme. So here is the area uh, this week. So the, uh, the, the paving has been reinstated. Um, well, the next phase of the uh, work is undertaken preparing that area for uh, the lift access. Um, we're going to touch on graffiti just now. Um, as the cloister is one of the most heavily graffitied areas in the cathedral. I mean, there's a lot of graffiti. I'm going to talk quite a lot about graffiti, actually. Um, now, quite often when you hear about uh, graffiti in these kind of spaces, it's uh, acknowledged as being something uh, that, that pilgrims might have done. Um, now, pilgrims wouldn't have had access uh, to this space. This is part of the monastic space until it, uh, and, and part of the ecclesiastical space until at least the 17th century. Um, so, probably not that much uh, medieval pilgrim graffiti. The other thing you might have heard about graffiti is that it's the work of schoolboys. Um, in this instance, actually, we can say that is the case uh, for some of these uh, graffiti. So uh, this this one here by uh, Blacksland. Um, now Blacksland was a a pupil at the King's School next door, and Peter Henderson, the archivist. Um, at King's School has done a huge amount of work in marrying up the, uh, the records of the King's School boys with some of the named graffiti uh, in the cathedral. Um, Blackson went on to be a, 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 an explorer in Australia, um, so he's, he's relatively well known. Uh, and this is a wonderful quote uh, in Peter's article. It says, there can be no doubt that persons old or young or middle-aged who commemorate themselves by inscribing their names or initials in churches or other historic buildings are highly reprehensible. Yet, the antiquarian is bound to admit that time may eventually confer interest upon such inscriptions, even if it does not entirely exculpate the original offenders. So we come down to this question of when, it, how old does graffiti have to be for it to be interesting? Uh, there is a huge amount of research uh, and undertaken an investigation into graffiti at Canterbury Cathedral. So all the way back into the middle part of the 19th century, people were noticing uh, these marks on the wall. So um, the inaugural meeting of the Royal Archaeological Institute and the British Archaeological Association took place in Canterbury in 1844, and a paper was read by Mr Godwin on certain marks of the Masons, many of which he had also recognised in Canterbury Cathedral. Uh, more from the Ar uh, Royal Archaeological Institute. Um, there are a number of very large-scale uh, inscriptions, um, particularly in the crypt um, and in the uh, Trinity Chapel. Um, and these as well have been described in the late Victorian period. So we have a quote here, traced out by shallow lines filled with modern colour, our Lord, seated in glory and given the benediction, surrounded by the emblems of the four evangelists. Uh, and that is the graffiti, or the, the scheme that is currently preserved under glass uh, there, and has been for at least 100 years, I think. Um, so it has been recognized and uh, assigned a significance. Uh, here in the Society of Antiquaries itself, um, we have these records by uh, Charles Elam Undated, which are a, a catalog of medieval mason's marks all the way uh, round the cathedral, so perhaps something to compare with uh, Rupert's work in the nave vaults. And in the, the 1960s, uh, William Murray, uh, so here he is, uh, the cathedral archivist, encouraged um, two schoolboys from King's School uh, to undertake their own uh, graffiti survey. Uh, the Horsfall Turner uh, brothers appear to have been given uh, a key <laughs> and, and told to go, well, told to go to it. Um, and they produced a, a really fantastic uh, archive um, which is held in the collections at the cathedral today. So we have uh, a series of notebooks describing uh, their discoveries and some spectacularly well-drawn uh, site plans with numbered 
uh, allocations to all of the uh, items that they found. Uh, so the Canterbury Journey is currently a uh, leading uh, project uh, to record, um, re-record the uh, inscriptions within that eastern crypt area. So um, it would certainly would appear um, that the, the sign here has not worked um, in any way. Um, so we're just going to have a quick look at a few examples of graffiti. Uh, so we're starting off with this, and I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but it says... Uh, Ken and Vera, uh, none better, um, and is possibly my first spot of a graffiti motorbike um, and also a graffiti cup of tea. Uh, so these are the things that are important to Ken and Vera. We have records from uh, World War II, so uh, periods of conflict quite often result in uh, increased amounts of graffiti. So. Uh, potentially able to identify uh, individuals from these kinds of uh, initials and dates uh, and field units. Uh, Ethelbert White from 1864 is, is indeed again very very clear he may uh, again be associated with King's School, this is in the Water Tower. Uh, we have a depiction of Dover Castle uh, on the walls of the uh, South Transept. We have a, a, a large number of these uh, 18th century uh, memorials, um, we think they are, and this one is extremely deeply incised and very obvious, so it, it, it certainly sort of reminds us of this idea that uh, up until the sort of 19th century uh, and into the 20th century, graffiti was both uh, accepted and acceptable, uh, so it's quite okay to leave your mark. Please don't take that as license to go and do that. Not the case now. Uh, we have lots of examples. I don't know if you can see how this compass drawn uh, design just here. This is on an 18th century uh, memorial so obviously shows that the, the creation of those kind of marks continues all the way into the post medieval period and massively exciting. This one has something in it so we might even have the compass point in there uh, and I have resisted the temptation to just take it and have a look at it. Uh, we have architectural sketches Again, so this is from uh, the Treasury Undercroft um, and some work by uh, Matthew Champion uh, in the area of the new organ loft uh, build, uh, construction in the North Choir Isle has revealed uh, possibly, we think, maybe some kind of astrological uh, symbols here and also uh, a lot of pre-Reformation text. There is pre-Reformation text all over the building. There are some lovely parallels to be drawn between the graffiti and manuscript uh, illustrations, potentially. So again, we're in the North Choir Isle here. Uh, and this one, um, again from the North Choir Isle, and this was uh, posted just recently by Alison uh, Ray, the assistant archivist, and I'm indebted to her for the reference. Now, this door is a clumsy way uh, of me linking into the last uh, part of this talk to remind me that this is a doorway into the final uh, part of the talk, but also just to, to, to contemplate that 12th century period. Um, this is a, a composite door, so the C-shaped uh, ironwork that you see here dates to around 1130. Uh, the timber and the strap work dates to around, uh, well, dates to 1175. So parts of this door are something that Thomas Beckett himself could have seen and parts of this door relate to that reconstruction of the building after the fire um, post his martyrdom. So we're just going to use the last few minutes of this talk to think about Thomas Beckett. Um, this year, as I mentioned, is a, is a hugely significant year for the cathedral. It is 850 years since uh, his martyrdom um, in the north uh, transept here. Um, and 800 years since his translation from uh, the tomb in the crypt uh, up to the Trinity Chapel itself. And on the other side of the slide here, you just see, uh, this is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, and is a depiction of uh, Thomas Beckett's martyrdom from around 1400. Now it's very appropriate to be talking about uh, Thomas in London because Thomas uh, was a Londoner. Um, so we see the quote here from uh, William Fitzstephen, who knew him. Uh, St Thomas has adorned both these cities, London by his rising and Canterbury by his setting. And this is the uh, seal of London. This is from the Museum of London. 
dating to the early 13th century and shows uh, Thomas Beckett in splendour. So he is very much associated with uh, both London and Canterbury. So just to reflect on his London roots, um, this is a reconstruction by Museum of London Archaeology showing the area uh, around number one poultry in around 1100. Uh, Thomas Beckett was born probably somewhere just up around here uh, in around 1120. So this is the, the street scene that Thomas Beckett uh, might have known. Uh, he also as well would have known uh, the site at Lambeth, um, and we see here a quote from Tim Tatton Brown below. During the middle years of the 12th century, it's very likely that the Archbishop's London House at Lambeth was considerably enlarged. Unfortunately, no 12th century buildings have survived. So unlike Canterbury, where we, we have a, a, a good understanding of that 12th century uh, palace site, Lambeth uh, remains largely unknown at that period. However, foundations may well be found, so that's something to look out for. And Thomas, is, as well, is also very much commemorated in the, in the day-to-day -day landscape of 13th century and later London. So at his birthplace, uh, we have the Church of St. Thomas and the Order of uh, St. Thomas Aiken. On London Bridge itself, there, is a, uh, there was a medieval chapel dedicated to uh, St. Thomas. You see the bridge here in the background, and at the front of the picture here, this is St. Thomas's Tower at the Tower of London, constructed in the late 13th century. And of course, St. Thomas's Hospital at what is now Southwark Cathedral, but was St. Mary Overy's Priory, is also a dedication to Thomas Beckett. So he would have been very much uh, in that medieval London landscape. So moving back to Canterbury, um, just a quick examination of some of the parts of the building that Thomas himself would have known. So these are parts of the building that were, uh, we know, already in situ by 1170 um, and include some of even the decorative elements of the building. So these wall paintings from St Gabriel's Chapel would have been there uh, during Beck Beckett's lifetime. He also would have recognised parts of the upstanding fabric. So here we're looking at the route way from uh, the crypt to the lower part of the uh, water tower. So again, mid 11th century uh, building construction here, as is the treasury building, again on the northern side uh, of the cathedral shown in this uh, historic photo where someone appears to have got their, I don't know, their hat or something in the corner of it there. So we are incredibly lucky to have a, a depiction of uh, Canterbury in around 1150, 1160 at the cathedral. Uh, this is the waterworks drawing um, and shows, you know, it gives us a huge amount of information about that, that uh, 12th century uh, building. So it shows the roots of the waterworks uh, and the piscina here at the fish pond at the end, shows you which water is fresh, which water is draining away. This is the water tower shown in large scale here just to highlight the importance. Here is the treasury building here. And this is the eastern end of the building. So here you see a square-ended chapel at the eastern terminus. And that is where Thomas Beckett was buried uh, in the crypt uh, immediately after his martyrdom. So this is Robert Willis's uh, plan uh, of that um, pre-1174 uh, building and showing this square-ended chapel. Now this, this is not proven by excavation, the sort of dimensions of that chapel, um, and is a, a relatively small space to be back, packing in up to 90,000 uh, pilgrims annually uh, by the late years of the 12th century. So certainly uh, gives us that indication as to why there is such a substantial uh, rebuilding on such a huge scale. Uh, so an examination <coughs> of the surviving fabric here is, is proving to be very, very interesting. Um, this is the uh, 1408, again, reconstruction by the University of York, showing that post-rebuilding um, phase. So after Thomas has been translated upstairs, it still remains uh, a site of pilgrimage, and people are still visiting, we understand, the original uh, tomb site in the crypt. Um, and potentially spending quite long periods of time there as well. So I've come to the end of my talk here. We're looking at uh, another view of Tony's wonderful um, pilgrim badge. And I'd just like to thank you uh, for having me here again today.